Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. Um, this webcast is part of ACM's commitment to uh, lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. Um, I'm your moderator. My name is Oana Olteanu. I'm a machine learning engineer turned uh, investor. I'm a partner at Signal Fire, where I uh, lead um, early stage developer tooling, open source, and AI investments. Uh, prior to VC, I uh, built enterprise software at SAP, and I have another grad and uh, graduate degree in computer science. And um, next, we're going to talk a bit about um, ACM for those who are, might be unfamiliar uh, with ACM. Um, ACM actually offers um, educational and professional development resources um, that enhance career opportunities, both for research and professionals. I'll highlight a few of them. Um, ACM offers access to a digital library which is the world's most comprehensive database of um, computing literature. Um, it also helps with um, curriculum development, teacher training, um, and uh, awards prizes in computing. Um, the other interesting thing about ACM is that um, ACM has compiled a code of ethics, which is a collection of principles and guidelines, which is um, meant to help professionals make ethically responsible decisions. And um, next, we're going to um, talk a bit about housekeeping items before we start the main talk. Um, four questions, please ask them in, at, at any time in the Zoom Q&A button. Um, we'll organize the questions um, as Matt speaks and then we'll address them at the end. Um, the session is being recorded, so you can take notes. At the same time, it will be archived and made available on learning.acm.org. Um, and yes, at the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey. And if you would have the time to uh, give us a bit of feedback, that would be amazing. Um, today's talk is large language models and the end of programming. And our speaker is Matt Welsh. Um, Matt is a CEO of co-founder of Fixie AI, um, Seattle-based company. Um, he was previously the head of engineering at OctoML um, and uh, software engineering at Apple and Xnor. He was an engineering director at Google and a professor of computer science at Harvard University. And he holds a PhD from UC Berkeley. Um, Matt, without further ado, please take it away. Thanks very much, Awana, and really appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to chat with you all today. Let me see if I can uh, go ahead and share my screen just a moment until I find the window. It's just a minute. And I think it's this one. Can you all see my screen? It's all there. All right. Excellent. Let me see if I can do the slideshow thing. Excellent. Okay. Now, today is a low test of Zoom uh, because we now have something like 1,700 people live on this talk right now. Um, it is by far the largest talk that I've ever given, uh, so uh, I also expect it will be the best. So, uh, you know, thank you all for attending today. <laughs> and as Awana said, if you have questions, please use the Q&A button in the uh, uh, Zoom app, and then we will uh, uh, take some of the questions at the end of the talk. All right, great. So why are we here today? Well, I think unless you've been living under a rock, um, you must be aware that there's this new technology that I kind of think of like alien technology that landed in our backyard, you know, maybe a year ago. That is uh, this idea of these large language models that have seemingly unbelievable powers to not just understand human text, but also to generate text, extremely realistic text, but even more importantly, and we're going to get into a fair bit of detail on this even more importantly, the ability to solve problems. And you can think about a large language model very much as a virtual machine that you can program in English. And my claim in this talk is that this is the beginning of the end of computer science as a discipline, as the way we understand it today. We'll probably still call it computer science once the dust settles, but the current field of computer science, I think, is 
um, going to change dramatically, even over just maybe the next, say, three to five years. Now, why is that? Well, I think fundamentally, if you think about the history of computing and why, um, you know, why, why is computing a field at all, the whole field has been based on this one core idea, which is it is about translating an idea into a program. And when we talk about a program, a program in particular uh, is something that runs on approximately a von Neumann machine, right? Something with a processor and memory and, you know, runs instructions and, you know, interacts with peripherals. That's the basic idea of all of computer science. Everything in computer science is about that one idea. Now, there's many aspects to that, of course, right? Some of us study theory, others study systems, others study databases or programming languages, but that's the core of the field. And my claim is that large language models are going to radically change how we think about that. And in particular, if you think about this field, it's always been about that these programs that we're talking about have always been implemented, you know, designed, implemented, maintained, and understood by humans. That there's always been this kind of gap between the human and the machine. And the job of the computer scientist is to map the idea from the human onto instructions that a machine can understand. Well, here's the spoiler, and I think we all kind of know this, right? Humans actually kind of suck at all these things, right? We're terrible at implementing programs. We're terrible about maintaining them. We're terrible about even understanding them. We're just not good at it. And so the question becomes, what happens in a future in which the machines that we're programming are not just these simplistic von Neumann architecture machines, but are uh, many orders of magnitude more powerful. So a lot of people have um, approached this problem, the problem of it being hard to program computers, uh, from the perspective of, well, let's just make programming easier. And, you know, I, I just want to make the claim that, you know, 50 years of programming language research has effectively done nothing to improve the state of affairs, or it's barely moved the needle. And the way I'm, uh, the, 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 the argument that I'm making here is, you know, we've had our try at making programming easier, right? We've developed new languages, we've developed new type systems, new mechanisms for debugging, static analysis, linters, documentation, training methodologies, all of these things. And yet we still write buggy programs and we still write <laughs> slow programs and we still have to uh, employ thousands and thousands and thousands of engineers to maintain and build software, right? So if we were actually solving this problem, I would claim that um, we would not be seeing the, the vast amount of money and time and energy going into this that we continue to see. And so the question is, you know, can we expect, you know, just around the corner, maybe there's just, you know, that, you know, that, uh, you know, grad student at University of Edinburgh is about to come out with the better language that's going to solve all the problems for us. I tend not to think that that's going to happen. Um, so let's just take a quick tour through the history of programming languages, right? Here's Fortran in 1957. Actually, this may be a variant of Fortran that came after 1957. There's so many versions of it, but this is a program that implements Conway's Game of Life. And I, you know, I could probably spend some time staring at it and scratching my head and, and trying to understand it. And I might be able to understand the program after some amount of time, but it's very unclear to me what this program is actually doing. Um, so as programming languages progressed, you know, we had BASIC in 1964 that was really designed to be the first programming language for the masses, so to speak, right? Something that makes programming languages so much easier uh, to, uh, to, to interact with. This isn't a whole lot easier, really, <laughs> right? It's the same program, uh, just in a different language. It's still pretty hard to understand. All right, then some brainiacs in you know the late 60s came up with things like APL. <laughs> this is the game of life in APL. And you know, I challenge anyone here to actually explain how this program works, let alone 
you know, teach other people how to program in this kind of extremely arcane syntax. Like, I'm not even sure what this was, what the idea behind this was. It, this might be beautiful to a certain kind of mathematician or a theorist or a programming language designer, but from the perspective of making programming an actual, you know, accessible thing, I don't think that this has succeeded. Now we get into some other interesting languages. I'm I'm using the next couple of examples a little bit tongue in cheek here because these are, of course, esoteric programming languages that are intended to be, uh, you know, impossibly hard to to program in and impossibly hard to understand. This is Malbolge, which was a language invented in 1998, and um, as I understand this language, it it is a um, you know it rewrites its own code and. Uh, the 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 manner in which it's interpreted is highly stochastic. It's quite difficult to predict what it's going to be. I think it was some you know five or six years after the language was invented that the first working program in the language was developed, <laughs> right? So that tells you how hard it is. Okay, but that one's a bit of a joke. Here's white space. This is a programming language in which all of the instructions are represented as spaces and tabs and new lines. All right. Um, but more seriously, let's come to, you know, modern programming language, you know, Rust, which is the new hotness, right? Everybody's talking about how amazing Rust is and how easy it is to use and how powerful it is. It's still super complicated. And so I have a feeling that we are um, not really addressing this challenge directly because we're thinking about um, representing programs in these machine-oriented languages. And I don't think that ultimately this is where the field needs, needs to go. So let's go to ChatGPT and see what we can get out of that, right? This is the new interesting way to develop software is instead of uh, a human trying to translate your ideas into these arcane languages, let's use uh, the AI to generate code for us. So if you go to ChatGPT and say, you know, please write code for Conway's Game of Life in x86 assembly code, um, well, even ChatGPT can't be fooled. <laughs> it says, I'm sorry, but writing code for Conway's Game of Life in x86 assembly code would be a very complex task, right? So it's not, <laughs> it, it's not uh, uh, fooled by my trick here to try to do that. However, I think if you had asked it to do this in Python or maybe C, it, it almost certainly would have. And so this changes the nature of our relationship between the way we think about human programmers and what the machines can do. And things get really interesting, I think, when you start to leverage the power of these large language models to generate programs for us. So on my team at Fixie, you know, we kind of have a joke. I, I I basically impose that everybody on the team use Copilot. For those that are not familiar, Copilot is an AI-based um, code assistant that's embedded in your IDE. And to first approximation, as you're writing code, it is auto-completing the rest of the code for you. So you could write a comment and it will write the rest of the function that you're trying to write. Or if you're just started to type out a line of code, it might write out the rest of the few next few lines for you. And so uh, for me personally, and I've been programming for you know decades, I find Copilot absolutely indispensable. I can't really write programs without it. Um, and part of the reason for that is when I'm writing code, I, I need to stay in the zone. And to stay in the zone, if I'm trying to figure out, oh, I can't remember what's the library call that I need to use to parse a URL or, you know, how do I call this, you know, this function or, you know, whatever the thing is that I need to do. Before Copilot, I would have to, you know, jump out of my IDE, go and type something into Google, hopefully find a Stack Overflow post or a blog post by somebody that approximately answers the question that I have. And, uh, you know, sort of munge the response into the thing that I was trying to do, and then go back into my IDE and paste that in. Um, however, uh, that also um, ignores the fact that 90% of the time when I leave my IDE and go out to my web browser, you know, I find myself half an hour later 
you know, browsing Reddit or something. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not being productive anymore. All right. So um, the way I feel with Copilot is more like this guy, right? Hacker man. Um, it's just amazing how powerful I feel when I'm writing code with this AI assistant guiding me. And um, the productivity boost I, I feel is quite real. And at least for me personally, but I think for entire teams, that's why at Fixie, we say everybody has to use it because um, if there's somebody on the team not using Copilot, they're easily 30 to 40% less productive, I think, than someone who does. So a lot of people have commented on Copilot and, and maybe treated it a little bit like it's a parlor trick or it, it, it's only good at uh, you know, generating solutions to undergraduate programming assignments. And, and you know, that was how it was evaluated in, in research papers. But if you use it in day-to-day -day life in your own code base, um, I think you'll find a couple of things. I, the first thing is it's really good about reading your mind. It's amazing how good Copilot is at predicting the next thing you want to do. And a, as an example, if I'm writing a, a series of unit tests, I often find that the next unit test ends up being generated by Copilot, and I can just let Copilot flesh out the next few examples. Um, and secondly, you know, Copilot is just, it, it understands your code base. It's not just parroting back things from its own training data set based on, you know, crawling GitHub or something. Um, it actually is um, pulling in context from your own code base. And, um, an even more kind of magical thing that I discovered is when I'm writing code, uh, if, sorry, if I'm writing documentation, let's say I pop out of a source file and I'm writing a readme file um, and I start writing about, you know, how to build this software, how to use this piece of code, Copilot will generate the documentation for me based on the code that I just wrote in a different file. So it's just really incredible how powerful this is. And I think that Frankly, we're just at the very beginning here, right? It's amazing how good Copilot is, given that we're, you know, it's it's a very, it's like the first version of this, um, effectively. So my own take on this is the only thing stopping tools like Copilot from getting, you know, really, really good is just more data and more compute. And it just so happens we have both of those in abundance. Right. And so I think it's just a matter of time and not very much time, really, until, you know, uh, the next uh, wave of AI powered programming tools are, you know, 10x better than they currently are. And as a field, I think we need to grapple with that. <laughs> right. I mean, I've already seen a lot of professors wringing their hands around, you know, oh my gosh, you know, what happens to my programming assignments that I give my students if uh, they're able to just let Copilot write the code for them, right? Um, we, you know, when you're interviewing someone for a job, how do, how do you evaluate them if the AI can just do the thing, right? And my own belief is that we need to assume that these tools are part of the tool belt we can't ignore them and just say, you know, they're tricks, they're parlor tricks, or they're cheat codes or whatever. Like these are, in fact, tools of the trade, and we need to allow people to use them. And we need to evaluate uh, how we uh, grade people and how we hire people based on the existence of those tools as a baseline. So another facet here uh, that's that's really interesting, and if you've played with ChatGPT recently, it's actually gotten much better at this over the last you know few months. Really, is you can treat ChatGPT kind of like your personal assistant, your expert that's sitting next to you in the seat next to you, so to speak, who understands a lot of things about programming, and is able to give you real-time advice and guidance in terms of how to do something when you're writing a program. And this was an example that I actually got the other day. I was using this um, uh, uh, this fantastic AI model called DeepGram. They, it's basically, it's a speech-to-text model. And just a short plug, This it's unbelievably fast and unbelievably accurate. Uh, way better than the Google model that I was testing it against. And 
Um, the problem was their documentation didn't have the really tight example of like, okay, I've got an MP3 file. How do I get the data out? Right. So I just was, I'm lazy. <laughs> I'm lazy. I'm super lazy. So I just said, well, I could probably kind of skim through the documentation a bit more and figure it out, but why not just ask ChatGPT how to do it? And ChatGPT says, sure, you know, here's how to do it. It's actually wrong about a certain fact, which is the Deep Graham library does in fact understand MP3. Now, uh, at the time that it was trained, you had to uh, convert the file to WAV format first, but that's that was easy for me to figure out. And so, and it even just gives me the code. I can just cut and paste the thing. I've talked with countless people about this. And, you know, a friend of mine um, who recently transitioned into a software engineering career after being an academic mathematician for many years was telling me that, you know, um, she was finding ChatGPT just so helpful in just asking the, 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 the questions about how to do things without having to pester her colleagues and look dumb in front of them, right? And, and you know, I said, look, you don't look dumb asking these questions, but, you know, there's often a, a point where you're not sure if you should bug someone if this is just like an obvious thing, and I just, I, I don't know exactly how to do it. Well, ChatGPT doesn't judge, <laughs> and Chat, ChatGPT doesn't mind you asking, you know, 30 questions of it if you need to, right? It's not, it's not um, uh, bugging anyone. So I, I think this is a tremendous um, accelerant for people learning how to program and being more effective. And hell, I've been, as I said, I'm a professional software developer and I, I still find it useful. So this leads me to kind of an interesting question, which is let's take this to kind of its logical extreme. Let's imagine for a moment that we could actually rely on the language models to generate all of our code for us. Like what happens if we wanted to actually, you know, fire the humans? I'm not suggesting we actually do this today, but let's do the math and see how it works out. So how much does it cost to pay a human programmer? Right? Um, well, I'm I'm guessing I'm estimating here, and you know we could argue about different markets and different skill sets and seniority levels and so forth. But you know the the numbers come out nice and tidy if I do it this way. So let's say that typical kind of senior software engineer salary in a place like Seattle or San Francisco is around two hundred and twenty thousand a year, right? Certainly not true everywhere in the world, but that's that's not not that not that outlandish. Uh, the other thing you got to keep in mind is as an employer, though, it's not just the salary that I'm paying people. I've also, you know, <laughs> got to pay for benefits and there's taxes. And if you, you know, happen to work at a place like Google, there's also free lunch, free breakfast, free dinner, all the snacks, the masseuse, the, you know, shuttle bus, the on-site doctor, the bowling alley, right? These things cost money as well, right? So just kind of ballparking it here. You know, let's imagine that kind of the total cost of ownership of a human SWE is something like 300, 312,000 a year, right? With 260 working days in a calendar year, that equates to $1,200 a day. All right. Um, not cheap. Okay. Uh, well, how much would it cost for an AI to do the same job that that human is doing? And so the first question is, how many lines of code does a human developer generate in a day? And, you know, unless, you know, you're just completely not in the field at all, you might, you know, be surprised to know that it's not that much, right? A typical software engineer, even in a place like Google, who's, who's coding all day, you know, the total volume of new lines of code that are checked into the code base every day is probably about a hundred lines. Cause I'm not including all the lines of code you wrote that were wrong, that you deleted and had to throw away and that, you know, stuff that didn't work out. And then you went through code review and the code reviewer asked you to change it and so forth. So I'm just sort of boiling it all down to a number. And by the way, I might be off by a factor of 10 or even a hundred, but you know, my point here is still going to hold. If you, uh, Ask GPT-3 how many tokens, because these models work in terms of tokens, a token is like a part of a word, are in a typical source code line, it's around 10. So that means that we're doing about a uh, thousand, you know, a thousand or something, you know, tokens a day, right? And the price for GPT-3 is 
you know, two cents per thousand tokens. Okay. So the question is, how much money does it cost? And basically, if you do the math, it works out to one human SWE day's equivalent work is something like 12 cents. Okay. And so just to kind of put that into perspective, I hired the AI to write code for me and it's writing code for 12 cents a day, you know, versus, you know, my human developer here who's costing me $1,200 a day. It's 10,000 X difference. This should scare us, <laughs> right? In a lot of ways, this should be a bit, bit of a wake up call because it suggests that the, the profession of writing software that we have expected to be this like really, you know, high paying field requiring many years of training to do it well and all of that is, is potentially going to become obsolete in its current form with the economics working out this way, right? And even if I'm off by, you know, a couple of orders of magnitude, I think it still, you know, portends a big change to our industry, right? There's all kinds of things, though, that are not quite comparable here, right? I mean, the robot doesn't take breaks, <laughs> right? The robot doesn't require catered lunches and on-site massage. The robot takes the same length of time to generate the code, whether you ask it for production ready final fully tested performance code versus prototype first stab code right if you go to a dev team a human dev team today and you say hey how long is it going to take for us to whip this together they might say yeah well you know by wednesday we could have like kind of a, a first cut but it's going to take two weeks to get it to be performant and robust and thoroughly tested and checked into the production system there's a big gap in the timing but not for the AI. And there's a lot of concern here around, well, but don't the robots make mistakes, right? They're not perfect. They're not perfect programmers. They often do get it wrong. Um, I don't know what kind of programmers you may be used to working with, but at least in my world, human programmers get it wrong quite a lot of the time as well. <laughs> but the other thing about a robot is when it makes mistakes, it can make those mistakes incredibly quickly. You don't have to wait four days, you know, for Albert to come back from, you know, vacation for the code review to happen, right? You can get the code nearly instantaneously, test it, benchmark it. And if it's working well, then you can check it in and be done. You don't need to wait for all these processes that are centered around humans. Um, so what does what does this kind of mean for the field? Like, what, what is it going to look like in the future as we're developing software when these AI tools are doing potentially the 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 lion's share of the work? And I found this. I think this is a video from Microsoft, and it says, you know, what do product managers do? And <laughs> my joke here is, <laughs> I, I, I wish we all we don't we all have that same question sometimes, right? No, but the joke is, right? Product managers might end up being the the main way in which humans inter interact with an AI powered development team. So imagine the software team of the future that maybe looks something like this, that you know a PM who's still a human, uh, probably is coming up with the requirements, is saying you know what what the product needs to do and is giving guidance in terms of the shape and the size and the capabilities and the trade-offs gives it to an AI, the AI can just blast out code at an unbelievable rate. And of course, we still have concerns about quality and testing and, and robustness and performance. And so there's probably still a role for the human code reviewer that needs to check that the code that was generated is correct. But one thing I want to point out here is a lot of what we do in human code review is to facilitate humans maintaining the software. That means a lot of back and forth happens around, well, did you document this well? Is this described in clear terms? Is this architected in a clean way? But I would argue that from an AI-generated code perspective, if the AIs are able to do this, we don't really care how clean the code is, right? It could look like this 
you know, this sort of proverbial minified, you know, JavaScript garbage that's super compressed and super dense. As long as it works and we can prove to ourselves that it works, it doesn't really matter if it's maintainable. Because if you need to make a change to it, guess what? You can just throw it away and generate new code in the same length of time it would have taken to tweak the existing code, right? Code is no longer this thing that we're kind of progressively enhancing through many, 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 many hours of human labor. It is an ephemeral thing that can just be deleted at any moment and replaced with completely new code, as long as you have the ability to test it. So this, I think, changes a lot of the dynamics about how we're thinking about this. I think it's really important that we all think about what this means. So, you know, we're, why are why is everyone in the world kind of freaking out about ChatGPT right now? And I think the answer basically is it wasn't until very recently that there was an accessible, usable AI system that did anything that normal people could interact with and um, experience. Right. We've had AI for many, many years. Usually it's locked up in labs in, in places that most normal people can't get access to it. Um, we've had AI doing things like face detection in your camera and playing chess and so forth. But it wasn't useful in a kind of day to day context. It was not something that you could communicate with in an open way, in an uh, unstructured way, just through natural language. Right. It was a feature embedded in your camera app or something like that. So this is kind of akin to if uh, computer graphics went like overnight <laughs> from Pong to Red Dead Redemption 2, right? That if it just like overnight, we, we, we had this amazing thing that people were so used to Pong and they thought that was the cutting edge of computer graphics. And then someone came out with, um, RDR2, you would, you know, people's heads would explode, right? And so I think that's what's happening here with ChatGPT, is that because ChatGPT has become, become so accessible, so widespread, so easy to interface with, and so powerful, just kind of right out of the box, people have, it's not like this been the slow progression of just AIs getting slightly better over the years, and now we have one that's decent. No, it was like, there was no AI and now there's AI. That's basically what's happened here. So the dialogue around this field has also shifted really considerably over the same kind of length of time. And, and back in 1972, Hubert Dreyfus wrote this book called, you know, What Computers Can't Do, The Limits of Artificial Intelligence. And, you know, the premise in the book is that there's some, I don't know, je ne sais quoi of how humans think and 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 how cognition works and creativity and you know some spark that a computer could never ever 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 replicate right and i i think now we're looking at things like chat gpt and stable diffusion and other ai systems and really questioning that argument i think that the idea that a computer can't be creative or a computer can't solve problems is um I think very much called into question. And a more recent book uh, that that you can think of as kind of the antipode to Dreyfus's book is Nick Bostrom's Superintelligence that explores a future in which AI becomes far more intelligent than humans. And it's a philosophy text. So it deals with the question of, you know, what happens to our entire society and what kind of motivations might a superintelligent AI have around its disposition towards the human race. And, and, you know, these are, of course, topics that have been covered, you know, extensively in science fiction and the Terminator and the Matrix and so forth. But um, this is a very serious book. And I think it's worth reading because it um, shines light on a future that I think is coming much faster than most of us are really prepared for. So, Next, I want to turn my attention away from kind of conventional programming and talk about where I see programming as a field evolving over the next few years. And so, uh, you know, the, the brief history of programming uh, here is, you know, in the dawn of time in the, you know, in the 60s, 
you know, a lot of programming or all of programming was really about humans directly putting instructions into the machine in the machine's preferred format, right? Toggling switches and so forth. Um, we evolved from that to what I would call early prehistory, which is writing programs in high level languages that the computer then compiles into the machine instructions. And here's, you know, Bjorn Straustrup, who's the inventor of C++, you know, looking super cool. Um, and I, I think that, you know, this, of course, is the world in which I grew up. This is how I think about computing. And, and this has been an invariant for decades. Um, I would say the modern uh, current time is that humans are writing in high level languages, but the AI is now assisting them. And as I talked about earlier, Copilot is doing a fantastic job at that. So this is a, an example of code I was actually writing the other day. And, you know, I started writing this function and I didn't have to finish it, <laughs> right? I just started typing the signature of the function. I gave it the little doc string and then voila, uh, uh, Copilot did the rest. So what does the future look like? And my claim is that the way we are going to think about computing and programming in the future is not about generating these programs and these arcane computer languages, but rather using the AI model as the computer. That is relying on the large language model as the computational substrate that directly solves problems. There's no programming anymore. You simply talk to the AI in English and it solves your problem. It is the computer. We don't go through some intermediate. We don't have the AI spit out Python or something. We just have the AI do the thing directly. And what humans need to do in that world, of course, is teach the AIs how to solve these problems. And so we become teachers, not programmers, right? Um, so the power here comes into focus if you start experimenting with the capabilities of these large language models and use them in a way that allows them to solve complex problems for you. So if you've looked at all into this field, there's this idea called chain of thought reasoning. And the idea here is you can give a fairly complex uh, task to a large language model like GPT-4. And the language model has been shown to be able to take that job to do, break it into steps, and effectively execute those steps one at a time while manipulating an internal world model as the execution proceeds, just like humans do, right? And this is shocking, or at least it was shocking to me the first time I saw this because I wasn't expecting this to be possible, right? My mental model was, well, we trained these LLMs to autocomplete text. They were given a corpus of documents on the internet and trained to fill in the next word. But somewhere along the way, when we did that and we made these models larger and larger and larger and we gave them more and more data to operate on, we seem to have accidentally invented a general purpose problem solving machine. It's actually capable of doing logical reasoning. So let me show you a um, just a quick example, but you can, there's many of these you can go in experiment with on your own. So I asked ChatGPT to solve a puzzle for me. Now, the thing is, I wanted to be careful not to ask it to solve a classic problem like Towers of Hanwai or something where it was a, um, like, probably in its training set, right? Because you could, you could ask it many, many, many quiz problems and so forth, and it already knows the answer. It's just going to pull it out of its memory. I wanted to give it ideally a new problem to solve, hopefully one that wasn't sitting on a web page somewhere that it had seen before. And so I said, you know, I'd like you to help me solve a puzzle. There are three stacks of cards on a table and the first stack is a red card, blue card and green card. You know, the second stack has these cards and the third stack has these cards. I would like you to tell me step by step how to order the cards so that there's one stack of red, one stack of blue and one stack of green. Please give me each step one at a time. And then here is the kind of crucial, magical incantation that you must use to get the model to do a good job at this. You have to say, let's think step by step. 
that kind of magic word, those magic words, give the model the the kind of prompt that it needs in order to break this problem down. And so if you give this to ChatGPT, you'll see it's doing it, right? It, it says, take the blue card from the first stack, place it in its own separate stack, take the red card and so forth. And it does the thing that I asked it to do, right? And that's remarkable because this isn't like there was some web page out there that already had this text. It has to manipulate a model of the world in order to do this. So I think that the, the implication here is that gradually programming as a field is going to get replaced by teaching models new skills. We're going to teach the model how to interface to an API, how to pull data from a database, how to transform data, how to use software tools meant for humans. And the question is, when you start to combine the power of a language model with all the rest of what we understand how to do with software, where do you get? What does that look like? The way that we have been thinking about this is uh, you can think of this very much like a natural language computer. I think of this like a new kind of computational substrate. Instead of the von Neumann machine with your CPU and your memory and your disk drive and so forth, this is a new kind of computer that has a large language model at the core. The language model is given access to external tools. We can think of those like peripherals. They It can go off and do a Google search. It can fetch web pages, it can call APIs, it can pull data from a database. As it operates, it builds up tasks in its working memory about what it needs to do next and what parts of the problem it needs to solve. It can use capabilities like uh, vector databases to maintain uh, both short and long-term memory about what it has seen in the past, all of the knowledge it has ever processed, as well as the working memory of the job that it is currently doing and that cycle can perpetuate this ends up being an extremely powerful way of thinking about programming in the future and you feed this natural language computer a program in natural language there's no programming language it's just english so i i want to take a quick detour and i promise to keep this short right but you know, as CEO of a startup company and being given this audience, I would be remiss not to say a little bit about um, what we're doing at Fixie. Fixie is effectively taking this idea and building a cloud service out of it. The idea behind Fixie is you can build applications using large language models that have a very, very high level interface to whatever your client is, whether it's a customer service widget on a web page or an enterprise automation system or a BI dashboard. And Fixie orchestrates a set of agents that live behind it, where those agents act as intermediaries between some data source, like a database or GitHub or whatever, and the large language model. And so by building these agents in and letting Fixie operate as that natural language computer, you can build extremely powerful applications. And just to show you a quick example, of what that might look like, um, let's imagine we had a, a customer support scenario where a person came to the web came to a website and said, "You know, I ordered the wrong size T-shirt. How can I can I exchange it for the next size up?" Well, Fixie can, using the large language models, determine that this ticket needs to go through multiple agents, where each of those agents does one step of the job. One of them looks up the order history. Another one checks to see if the T-shirt is in stock. And the final result is a draft response back to the customer saying, here's all the information you need, right? And you might still have a human reading that and tweaking the wording of that before they send it out. But in the future, I don't think it will be necessary to have humans do that because the quality will be, will be so incredibly good. In Fixie today, the programming model still looks like code, right? You're still building these agents. And the way you build these agents is by connecting uh, the language model with code that you provide. So in this case, we're teaching the language model how to look up stock prices. And we're just giving it a little bit of code and the language model is learning how to call that function when it needs to. 
And you can also build agents just by giving it things like a list of URLs. So this is an agent in Fixie that answers questions about the TV show Silicon Valley, which has become my life over the last <laughs> six months. And uh, all we're doing here is just giving it a list of URLs and the agent is automatically generated from the content of those documents. Okay, so now we return you to your regularly scheduled tech talk. And I want to leave some time for questions, so I just have a couple more slides left. So if we think about what's happening in computer science and how it's evolving, one might draw an analogy to, you know, a tool like the slide rule, which was, you know, for more than 100 years, the fundamental tool used in many disciplines of science and engineering to solve problems, right? Today, I don't know very many people who own a slide rule, let alone know how to use one. And I wonder whether we're going to look at, you know, this on the right as, you know, the sitting in front of the computer with uh, Visual Studio Code and writing Python or whatever as the way of what, what it, that, that's what we all think of as computer science today. I, I question whether that will be the case in, you know, five years. I think we're going to have a very different view about what it means. I think that over time, computer science, the way we currently conceive of it, might start to look a little bit more like EE does to computer science, which is it's a more technical skill set that's necessary in some very specialized occupation. So the field doesn't go away. EE didn't go away because we invented software. But I think the vast majority of people building software will not be programming. They're going to be interacting with an AI. And I also believe that AI, using AI in this way, has this amazing potential to vastly expand access to computing beyond that privileged set of highly trained individuals that learned how to program, right? There's something like 30 million people in the world that know how to write computer programs. But there's nearly 8 billion people in the world. And my belief is that if we could close that gap and let the AI do the amazing things it's good at, we could expand access to computing to the rest of those people. Because all you need is natural language. You don't even need to be literate. You don't even need to know how to type. You don't need to know how to interact with an IDE and you sure as hell don't know how to need to know how to program in C++. So back in 1984, John Gage at my uh, Sun Microsystems coined this, uh, this expression, you know, the network is the computer. Very powerful idea, carried us for a very long time. I, I, I'm now coining this expression, which is the model is the computer. <laughs> I think that's where the world is going. And I think that, you know, the sooner we adopt this way of thinking about large language models, um, the better the better off the field uh, of computing will be. Um, so last thought here, we don't understand how these AI models work. And all of our understanding of them is very much an empirical process, right? We didn't know about this chain of thought reasoning. That was not designed. That was discovered after the fact, after people had trained these models. And so the silver lining in all of this, in my mind, is, you know, really writing code kind of sucks anyway. Why don't we just let the robots do it and go and have a good life? There's lots of exciting things to work on, many new discoveries to be made. Maybe programming is better left to the AI. And with that, I'll say thank you very much, and we can take some questions. Thanks, Matt. We have 138 questions and going in the q and I've selected a few of them. Um, first one from Jason Elbaum. I've heard talk about the imminent end of programming at least since the early 90s. Then it was visual programming, which was going on to replace programming languages. There are good reasons why we don't program computers in English. Why should I believe that LLMs change anything of substance? Is ambiguous natural language the right tool for specification of a customized functionality of an application? Yeah, no, this is a great question. And I do think that there's something vastly different about the capabilities of large language models and what I would 
argue are, you know, just very minor UI affordances in something like visual programming, right? I mean, these are vastly different things. And what I'm not talking about here so much is just translating English into computer code, but as I said earlier, using the language model as the computer itself. And we've barely begun to scratch the surface of what's possible here. Now, I grant I might be wrong on this, and it might turn out that the capabilities of these language models are in fact just extremely limited and they don't do a very good job at generalizing and solving hard problems. And we can use them for easy stuff, but not for hard stuff. That could be the case. I don't personally believe that given the tremendous amount of, uh, of ad advancement that we've seen in the language model capabilities just over the last like six months. So it's very hard to predict the future when you're looking at a couple of recent data points and you're on an exponential. <laughs> so I tend to say, let's assume let's we're on an exponential, what's gonna happen next? Um, so I think, yeah, my answer really is, I think the language models are going to be much more powerful than we think that they are today. Got it. Um, next question from John Smith. What about the AI Kessler syndrome? One day I just copy garbage code from another AI. You mean, oh yeah, so garbage in, garbage out, effectively. It's, you know, I'm copying garbage code from one from one place to another. I, I'm less concerned about that. I think that generally speaking, the way that we evaluate software systems is through their external effects and their usage in a product. And a lot of a lot of ink has been spilled on this problem of well, oh my gosh, you know what you, you know what what happens if some undergraduate copies code from ChatGPT into the you know control system for the you know the airplane and it crashes or something like I'm not no one is suggesting that we should just throw away all of our QA practices <laughs> in order to use AI. I think that there's so many checks and balances involved that. Um, you know, garbage code is going to get filtered out just like it does today. Got it. Um, from Viraj Kumar, do you let um, interviewees use Copilot in your hiring process more generally? How do you see this technology changing the hiring process for software developers? Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I don't know how to think about this. Um, using, you, you know, on one hand, it would be I, I'm perfectly fine when when we give someone like a take home assignment as part of an interview, we encourage them to use Google, use Stack Overflow, you know, code the way you normally would. It would be ridiculous to say, oh, but you need to turn off Copilot like that. That would be silly. So then again, the challenge is how to evaluate programmers in a post Copilot world. Right. And the way that we've tended to evaluate programmers in interview scenarios and even in academia. I think is rapidly um, becoming antiquated because you know these little toy problems that we give people to see if they can do the thing, it, it, it's, it's no longer relevant if the AI can just do that for you. It would be like giving somebody a spelling test and telling them to turn off you know, spell check. So mm -hmm. I think we need to up our game in terms of how we evaluate people. And what is it that we really need to evaluate here? Is it that they know how to reverse a linked list in Java? Or is it that they can do something meaningful and relevant to their job, even with all of those tools at their disposal? And yeah, that's hard to evaluate. That's really hard to evaluate if you're asking somebody to stand up at a whiteboard. And it's also hard to evaluate if you give them you know, an overnight programming challenge. So I don't have a good answer on that one right now. Uh, the next question, still in the same vein from Susan Imberman, as a college professor teaching undergraduate students, what advice should I give my students with regards to their future in the new chat GPT enhanced computer science field? Yeah, this one's hard. This one's really hard. And I think, um, you know, over the, say, five year time frame or maybe even 10 year time frame, I think undergraduates starting in computer science today are not going to see the field completely disrupted, but by the time you graduate, the world will be quite different than it is today. I don't think that we're looking at a wholesale, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, people losing their jobs and entire organizations full of software developers getting fired because the AI is doing such a great job. I don't think we're there yet. I think what will happen more is over time, we're going to see a shift away from 
needing to hire hundreds or thousands of developers to develop code and maintain code. Um, and we are likely to see some kind of contraction in the industry. I think there will be less demand for just people who know how to generally write Java or JavaScript or something. I think that to excel in the field, you're going to have to bring other skills to bear, better communication, design skills, and so forth. So it's a little early to say how this is going to play out. Um, the thing that concerns me is not the undergraduates in college. It's all the people in those coding boot camps that are you know, trying to just get the basic skill set there. Uh, the question will be, is there a, a lot of demand for people with basic programming skills? Got it. Um, from Eliar Asgari, isn't it dangerous to rely completely on LLMs? We will all get lazy to check, and eventually when mistakes happen, we will not understand machine language anymore. I think it's a good question what happens to the idea of programs in a world where you trust an LLM to do most of it for you. Um, you know, perhaps an analogy is I spend almost no time thinking about the firmware on the processor of my laptop and how it works. I spend almost no time worrying about the transistor layout on that M2 chip or whatever. Now, there are people that do need to understand that. Absolutely, right? We're not at the point where we can just completely automate that expertise away. But I think that our relationship to software will change from having an expectation that we as humans can go and manually inspect it. If I just had the source code, I could find the bug to one where yeah. the language models are so unbelievably sophisticated and complex that we really recognize that we have no hope of understanding them. And that might end up making the field of computer science looking more like the field of psychiatry, <laughs> trying to understand <laughs> the inner workings of the model from the outside rather than thinking of it like a, you know, let me just fire up GDB. Very interesting. Um, one anonymous attendee has asked, in my experience, only 20% of programming time is spent in actually writing code, and 80% is spent on debugging. How will LLM generated code change this ratio, even if the debugging method changes the prompting? Yeah, that's a great question. It is very, very true that you know writing new code is only a small fraction of the time that we spend. Um, you know, I don't know. That's that's a good one. I think, you know, why are we debugging at all is because it didn't work. Uh, and so the question is, maybe we can get to a point where the mechanisms for generating code and testing code are in such a tight feedback loop that we can automatically test things in a far more robust way than we currently do. Um, I just have a feeling that a lot of that debugging kind of challenge arises mainly because it's a slow human driven process to write code, test it, see when it works, see where it doesn't work, find a bug, iterate. But if the machines can do that at lightning speed, I think it might change the dynamic and possibly we could get to a future in which debugging is no longer really a thing, that the software is being automatically tested so thoroughly as it's being generated. That's awesome. And now the last question um, that concerns a lot of the parents in the chat, what do you think uh, needs to change in the approach to education, literally at the elementary school level, not high school, what different reasoning and communication skills need to be learned by our kids? This is a very hard question to answer. I don't know yet. I have two kids of my own, one of whom is in elementary. And, and you know, I know that the world that he's growing up in is one that is going to look vastly different than the world that I grew up in. And I don't think any of us in our society are really adequately prepared for that. Um, I, I just don't have a good answer in terms of how to be thinking about the skills that we need to be teaching our kids um, what kind of skepticism should they have when they approach an AI system? How much should they trust these systems? How much should they incorporate them into their daily lives? Um, and, and, you know, a lot of it might look a little bit like, you know, they don't really teach things like how to write in cursive or long division 
anymore. I mean, some places do, but not a lot. And that's in part because we've recognized that different skills are more important to teach kids these days. And I think in a post AI world, we're going to find a very different set of skill sets that are far more relevant than, you know, how to use a calculator. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm afraid we ran out of time today. Thank you, Matt, for the informative presentation. And I would like to thank each of you um, who joined us and asked questions. Um, don't worry, the presentation is recorded and will be made available to all of us on learning.acm.org. Um, if you have time, please take the quick survey at the end. Um, and on behalf of ACM, Matt Welsh and myself, Juan Altenu, I will thank you again for this talk and uh, looking forward to stay connected afterwards. Thank you so much. And thanks for coming. And thank you, Awana, for hosting. My pleasure. Have a great day. Bye.